Sabbath blessings to my home church, Atlanta Berean. It's been so many years ago that my face is new for most of you, but I grew up right down that street, Collier Road, and my mother would take us by the hand when my father was traveling in the Great South Atlantic Conference, and we would walk up Collier Road to church right here at the corner. And I remember those days. In fact, I remember as a little bitty guy that church being under construction, and it is just a privilege and an honor to be here in this pulpit where Pastor Freddie Russell holds forth. God bless you. Thank you for the opportunity to minister to you today. Special blessings and gratitude to your senior pastor, Pastor Freddie Russell, for extending the invitation. And I want you to know you have a marvelous team here, an organized, special, uh, very detailed team. It was not long after I received the invitation from your pastor that your first elder reached out to me. And after he communicated with me, Minister Luther Washington reached out to me and all of the machinery of Berean and for what you're well known for began to turn. And it was just a marvelous, marvelous thing to be able to say, that's my home church. Let me dial back just a few minutes, if, if I may. Um, well, before I do that, let me, let me acknowledge something for you. Sometimes we do not really understand, appreciate, or respect the depth of leadership, the quality of leadership that God has allowed to be at the helm. And none of us as men of God or women of God are perfect. We are certainly not flawless but we are fabrics that are still being woven in the loom of God's grace and opportunity. And certainly, certainly, I have to take just a second to thank God for what he has done in the life of Pastor Freddie Russell. Let me share with you, in case you don't know, this past week he was in leadership, teaching, coaching, and mentoring in the Inter-America Division. Now, for someone who has worked at a general conference level institution, I'm here to share with you that that's major because the Inter-American Division is the watershed, if you will, of the leading divisions within the Seventh-day Adventist Church. Out of the 13 global divisions, Inter-American Division has consistently set the pace and I'm grateful to say that your pastor was there among the other stellar lineup of individuals sharing leadership uh, tips and coaching and mentoring. And I think we ought to praise God for that. We ought to also celebrate his wife, his lovely wife, Brenda. I enjoy coming to Brenda and, and uh, Pastor Russell's home because... Brenda, you know, Brenda and I eat the same. Uh, we're baptizing Pastor Russell bit by bit. And, and uh, he, he's growing into that. But nevertheless, we eat the same. And so whenever I walk through her door, I know that I'm going to enjoy her cuisine. And God bless the family, the, the couple that has started um, TrueHealth.tv. Is that correct? Where are you? TrueHealth.tv. Uh, praise the Lord. No, raise your hand up a little bit higher. I want you to know that we ought to say thank God for their vision, thank God for their faith, thank God for their boldness, and I want you to know that you need to partner with them as a person who has owned a television ministry, who founded a television ministry. I want you to know it is no easy task to provide the funding for what is required to stay viable and competitive. And so I want to challenge you to partner with them. Let God speak to your heart as to what you can do to make a difference in their lives and specifically the ministry of TrueHealth.tv. I want to dial back for just a moment and let you know that it's always a pleasure to be in the presence of a childhood friend, James Lamb. Do you, can't, I mean, don't you just love Dr. Lamb? We not only grew up together, we played together, and there are many other people who um, are no longer walking with the Lord who were a part of our developmental years. And we went to academy together at Mount Pisgah Academy. 
And so our lives have been connected and intertwined through the years. And I just want you to know how much I love you, how proud I am of you, and what God has done. And you stayed here at home. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. I want to make one last uh, comment of acknowledgement. I want to uh, acknowledge Mark Bunny. Where did he go? Is he, did he step out? Well, Mark Bunny and I had the privilege to work together in a major revival at the Ephesus Seventh-day Adventist Church in Harlem in New York a few years ago. And so before he started playing, I leaned over to Pastor Russell. I said, have you ever heard him before? He said, no. I said, all right, well, I, I won't say anything because, because he is so gifted, so capable, so able. You don't need to say anything. Just let him do what he does. Amen. And then finally, I want to uh, acknowledge my son. Uh, not all of my family is away. Deidre and my youngest, Gabriella, are up in Detroit. And then Matthew is doing literature evangelism work in the state of Michigan with the Michigan Conference. And uh, Christine, uh, proud of her. She just graduated from Loma Linda, Loma Linda University uh, School of Public Health. And she is now in Geneva, Switzerland. And she is working with the World Health Organization. But my son, my firstborn, Samuel Ellington Thomas III. Where are you, buddy? I saw you. I saw you back there. There he is. No, he's behind the camera. Sammy, come up here. I want everybody to see how much we look alike. Come on. I, I just want to share with the men of Berean and those who are watching in our webcast. This won't take but a second because he moves quickly. Amen. Praise the Lord. Um, that it's important to celebrate our young men. Amen? <laughs> I love this guy, all right? So uh, this is Samuel Ellington Thomas III. My father, Samuel Thomas Sr., is laying in his grave, waiting on the coming... <clears throat> of the Lord. And um, he was one of the pioneer leaders in the South Atlantic Conference. And so we bear his name. We try to carry the torch, represent him well. It's important for men of God to look like men of God. What do you say? Amen. Father, this is your hour, and I pray, O oh God, in the name of Jesus, who alone makes it worthy for me to stand here, that you will speak to our hearts, correct us, challenge us and comfort us, we ask in Christ's name, amen. There are three principal passages of scripture. My apologies to the audiovisual team. I should have shared with you these other passages, but I'm going to give them to you now so you will know the journey of the message today. In addition to Ezekiel chapter three, we will take a brief look at it. Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 and 10. Exodus chapter 24, verses 9 and 10. And we will also consider a passage in Revelation that I will share with you, select verses, Revelation chapter 4. Ezekiel is probably one of the most obscure books of the prophetic writings that we have. Out of the 66 books, there are some that are in groupings and we have, within the word of God, we have prophetic books. Isaiah, who talks about Christ. And then there's Jeremiah and Ezekiel and Daniel. What most of us may not be aware of is that 
Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and Daniel were contemporaries. They coexisted, different locations, with a unique prophetic word. Jeremiah deals with Israel and where they are. Ezekiel defines the why of the captivity. Jeremiah gives the warning. Ezekiel gives the consequences. And Daniel gives the hope. But wrapped into each one of these prophets' messages are unique imagery, or is unique imagery, that defines God's overwhelming three Ps. I want you to note three Ps. His providence, his provision, and his presence. And in the book of Ezekiel, the imagery sometimes trips us up. And I never will forget discussing with Dr. John Pauline. He and I were riding together once and I asked Dr. Pauline, who is one of the church's foremost writers and students and theologians on the book of Revelation. I asked him, why don't we hear more out of Ezekiel? Why isn't more shared with us out of the book of Ezekiel? And then he began to explain to me that in reality, it's because we haven't focused on it. So today, we're going to focus on the book of Ezekiel. Ezekiel chapter 3. And I want to read a succession of verses for you that will encapsulate the conclusion of this phenomenal vision that Ezekiel has that we all know about. And we know about it because a spiritual was written as a result of it. Ezekiel saw the wheel way up in the middle of the air. And we all know that song. But that song does not do justice to what is a profound theophany. That's a new word maybe for you, but it's a theophany. It is this intersection of God displaying with man who he is and who we are not. In Ezekiel chapter 3, I want to begin with verse 10. Listen to what the word of God has to say. Then the Spirit took me up. And I heard behind me a great voice, a great, I heard behind me a voice of a great rushing saying, blessed be the glory of the Lord from his place. I heard also the noise of the wings of the living creatures that touched one another and the noise of the wheels over against them and a noise of a great rushing. So the spirit lifted me up and took me away, and I went in bitterness and in the heat of my spirit, but, the King James Version says, but the hand of the Lord was upon me, was strong upon me. Then I came to them of the captivity of Tel Aviv that dwelt by the river of Kibar. And I sat where they sat and remained there astonished among them seven days. And it came to pass at the end of seven days that the word of the Lord came unto me saying, Son of man, I have made thee a watchman unto the house of Israel. Therefore, hear the word at my mouth and give them warning from me. When I say unto the wicked, thou shalt surely die, and thou givest him not warning, nor speakest to warn the wicked from his wicked way to save his life, the same wicked man shall die in his iniquity. But his blood will I require at thine hand. Yet if thou warn the wicked and he turn not from his wickedness, and he turn rather not from his wickedness, nor from his wicked way, he shall die in his iniquity, but thou hast delivered thy soul. Again, when a righteous man doth turn from his righteousness and commit iniquity, and I lay a stumbling block before him, he shall die. Because thou hast not given him warning, he shall die in his sin. And his righteousness, which he hath done, shall not be remembered. 
but his blood will I require at thine hand. Nevertheless, if thou warn the righteous man that the righteous sin not, and he doth not sin, he shall surely live because he is warned. Also, thou hast delivered thy soul. The message today is simply is entitled simply, He has his hand on me. Ezekiel has to explain to some very, very troubled people why they are in Babylon. They are to live out 70 years in captivity. 70 years of struggle. 70 years of change. 70 years of strange language. 70 years of a of a most oppressive environment. They have to endure hardship that they didn't plan on, yet they lived recklessly, not recognizing that there would be consequences for their behavior. And Jeremiah, when he lifts up a word and he talks about what is happening in Jerusalem and that they would be besieged and that Nebuchadnezzar's army would march against them and that he would take them captive. They made mockery of Jeremiah. They put him in a pit. They put him in stocks. They didn't like what he was preaching, but nevertheless, Nebuchadnezzar's army marched, besieged Jerusalem to the point that they were eating their children and all of a sudden they find themselves now marching hundreds of miles along the fertile crescent going from Jerusalem up and around through southern Turkey and northern Syria and down into Babylon, which is now modern-day Iraq. And when they arrive there, we have this famous psalm that comes to us. Turn with me, Psalm 139. I want you to, to see this psalm because it's a powerful psalm, Psalm 139. And you've heard this psalm before. It says, by the rivers of Babylon we sat, we wept when we remembered Zion. Okay, let, let's look at that, Psalm 139. Uh, seven, pardon me, 137. By the rivers of Babylon, there we sat down. Yea, we wept when we remembered Zion. We hanged our harps upon the willows in the midst thereof. For there they that carried us away captive required of us a song, and they wasted us, required of us mirth, saying, Sing us one of the songs of Zion. Verse four, how shall we sing the Lord's song in a strange land? Verse eight, O daughter of Babylon who art to be destroyed, Happy shall be he be that rewardeth thee as thou hast served us. This is not only a recognition of their condition, but it is also a hope and a promise that Babylon would be destroyed. There's this desire, there's this longing, there's this hunger within them that Babylon will be destroyed. But we first of all have to understand why they are in Babylon. God's people are in Babylon because they would not choose righteousness. They would not choose holiness and they wouldn't choose God's way. And how do we know that? We know that because at the beginning or the onset or the outset rather of this particular vision that God gives Ezekiel, he gives him a vision. He gives him a vision and in this vision as the graphic artist tries to portray in a and an image that they're going to put up on the screen very shortly. He's lying prostrate on the ground and, and he's trying to capture all of the glory that he sees and he sees this imagery and he tries to capture what is really going on because the imagery is something that he's never seen before. He is seeing this profoundly unique environment that is beyond explanation. So he tries with human tongue to explain what he sees. Go with me to chapter 1, and this is how he explains it. It's Ezekiel's vision of four living creatures. And I looked, and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north. Came out of the way, everybody? Came out of the way, everybody? Now, the reason that that place or that location is significant is because the psalmist says that God's throne is in the sides of the north. So this FedEx package from glory, if you will, is coming straight out of the sanctuary of God, coming straight 
to Ezekiel because God is determined to give to Ezekiel a message that his people will understand that there is a holiness, a righteousness that God has and that he lives in this holiness and righteousness. And notice, if you will, he expresses it through symbolism. This is how God explains himself. Listen to what it says. And I looked and behold, a whirlwind came out of the north, a great cloud and a fire enfolding itself and a brightness was about it. And out of the midst of thereof was the color of amber out of the midst of the fire. Also out of the midst thereof came the likeness of four living creatures, and this was their appearance. They had the likeness of a man. Everyone had four faces, and everyone had four wings, and their feet were straight feet, and the sole of their feet was like the sole of a calf's foot, and they sparkled like the color of burnished brass. And they had the hands of a man under their wings on their four sides, and they four had their faces and their wings. Their wings were joined one to another. They turned not when they went. They went everyone straight forward. As for the likeness of their faces, Faces, verse 10, they four had the face of a man and the face of a lion on the right side, and they four had the face of an ox on the left side. They four also had the face of an eagle. If you read on through this passage, you will find out that when he sees this vision that God's throne is situated, it is positioned with the color that denotes blue, which blue, representing the law, is the foundation of which Moses saw. Now we're going to go to, to Exodus chapter 24, and this is how we're going to understand the Word of God, because we're going to be able to compare this scripture with Exodus chapter 24. And then it says in Exodus 24, verses 9 and 10, Then went up Moses and Aaron, Nadab and Ebahu and 70 of the elders of Israel and they saw the God of Israel and there was under his feet as it were a read with me a paved work of what everybody a sapphire stone and as it were the body of what heaven in his clearness and this sapphire stone is blue I mean we know the sapphire is blue and the reason that this is important is because you see the sapphire stone in Exodus you see the sapphire stone appearing again in Ezekiel chapter 1 and 2 and here is where God through symbolism defines who he is his throne although it has wheels and it's in constant motion, which gives us the understanding of his omnipresence, his capacity to move anywhere he wants to. God is not limited like we are limited. God is not fixed like we are fixed. God is not bound like we are bound. God is here yet can be over there. God is everywhere at the same time. I don't understand it. I receive it. Come on, somebody. It's a powerful thing to know that God, not only in his symbolism, not only in his declaration, not only in his disclosure, he wants us to know that he is not limited. He has wheels. Now, the reason that this is profound is because God does not disclose himself as having wheels until Ezekiel, because at the time of Egypt and the time of the Exodus and at the time that Moses would have seen, it wouldn't have made as much sense because there was or there is enough archaeological evidence to understand that wheels were really not that prominent at the time of Moses. So when God speaks to Moses, y'all not with me today, he doesn't show him wheels, but by the time he gets to Ezekiel, he doesn't show him a fixed throne. He shows him a throne on wheels. He shows them a throne of wisdom. And then when he shows in Daniel chapter 7 and 8, when God is seen on his throne, high and lifted up as Isaiah also saw him, he is seen in this point of majesty. He is also seen surrounded by angelic hosts. It's the same thing we're going to see in Revelation chapter 4. It's powerful. It's gripping. It's telling. But the most important thing for us to come away from this exposure is this simple principle that God's principles, not to be repetitive, but God's principles, God's commandments are fixed. They're unchangeable. And the reason that blue is conveying that is because blue is the symbol of the law. 
Oh, now, if you don't believe me, if you ever see blue lights come up in your rearview mirror, what do you know? <laughs> Am I right about it? You know that you've been stopped by the, by the law. And for, so in this, in this contemporary Christian context where we're always trying to make grace the only thing worth preaching about, I've got news for you. You can't preach grace without preaching law because if it were not for the law, I would not know sin, Paul says. And because I know sin, I know I need grace. Are y'all with me today? And it's the law that convicts. And that's the reason why you find a response both in Exodus chapter 24 and then also in Ezekiel 3. You find this synonymous behavior that's not scripted. The same happens with Isaiah and Isaiah 6. It's, it's not scripted. They immediately fall on their faces. So much holiness, not just glory, but holiness. Holiness is what I long for. And you've got to want it in your heart. And Ezekiel captures this essence of, of why his people are in captivity. Why there was a 70-year verdict on their behavior. Here it is in a nutshell because God's principles cannot change. God uses corrective measures to get our attention. See, sometimes when we ask for healing, as I tell my church, City Temple, and City Temple is a church that has great history like Berean, and you know, we're just north of the frost line. Y'all missed that. Okay, let me try it again. We're north of the frost line. Uh, you know, you all shut down when there's snow. We have church. Snow does not stop us. And, and let me help you. In fact, we don't even, Michigan is so used to snow, they, they don't even have school closures. You know, I never forget Gabriella woke up and she looked outside, hallelujah, the school is closed today. All schools are open But up there, they're proud of their history as Berean is proud of their history. But I, I have news for you. Your history does not, does not qualify you for greatness in the cause of God. I, I, I hate to break it to you. I mean, I know that you've got photographs galore. I mean, I've been on the website because Berean is home. So every now I take a little sneak peek and I look to see all the faces I know and I don't know and all that kind of stuff. I go to the website and Facebook site and all that kind of good stuff. But guess what? That is not impressive to God. And so the children of Israel got full of themselves. And so when they got full of themselves, they turned to idol gods and they turned to idolatry in such a strong way that they actually, according to the Old Testament, they were offering their children to Molech. And Molech was the, was the supreme deity that always required child sacrifice. So let me ask you this question. How many of our children have we sacrificed? Oh, let me tell you how we sacrifice our children today. We sacrifice our children by not believing that church school is still valid. Oh, yeah, you know, all school is the same. Is it really? When I put my child under the indoctrinating influences of evolution, y'all not with me today? Huh? Huh? And when I live or, or dwell under the or put my child where they have to live or dwell in this classroom for X number of hours per week, and they are being indoctrinated with the idea that there is a true transgender. I mean, I just appreciated your word, Dr. Lamb, because Satan does want to break down within the Christian family, with, no, more specifically, within the Seventh-day Adventist Christian family, that we no longer have principles. Well, it doesn't mean you hate people. It just means that there's a standard. 
If my wife came home one day, God forbid, and she said that she was gay, she would leave that day. Because two can't walk together except they be in agreement. I mean, I'm going to say, I love you, baby, but you got to go. Y'all not with me today. If, if, if one of my children came home and said, you know, Dad, I'm gay, I would say, okay, I love you, but don't bring no partners up in here. Standards. I love you, but there's a boundary. And why is there a boundary? Because I don't want to send the message that I, that I endorse. You see, the challenge that we have as Christians is that we must always love without sliding into endorsement. There has to be a separation. And so the reason that they're in captivity is because they embraced, embraced idolatry wholesale. Unfortunately, it was spiritual leadership that led them that way. I hate to break it to you, but it was Solomon who set the tone. Solomon set the tone. For all of his wisdom, he was crazy about women. Y'all not with me today? Let me say it one more time. For all of his... For all of his wisdom, he was crazy about women. He was so crazy about women that whatever they brought, he took. And they brought idolatry up in God's house. He said, let's roll with it, baby. And eventually, they had so defiled the house of God, they had so defiled their understanding of God, that God says, I want to correct you of these issues. I want you to know that my principles are still necessary. So he sends them generations later, which he had already predicted to David, he sends them generations later into captivity. And when he sends them into captivity, let me fast forward to tell you after the 70 years had transpired, when they came out, idolatry was never a problem again. If you want to know sometimes why difficulties and, and hardships befall us, maybe, just maybe, God meant it to happen. See, you see, unfortunately, we want to make everything the devil's We want to blame everything on the devil. Now, of course, sin makes us want things that are not good for us, right? So if you, let me help you like this. If you eat the wrong thing over and over and over again, and then you walk up in the cardiologist's office, and he says, you got blockage, you got this, you got that, and then the nephrologist tells you your kidneys are failing, don't say the devil did it. Everybody say, I receive it. There you go. Okay. Okay? It's like the man who smokes and then he gets lung cancer and then he asks for the doc, he asks for the, the pastor to come and say, Pastor, I want the anointing. All right, let me tell you what anointing you need. You need the anointing to break the habit. So when we talk about we when we talk about cause and effect, which I thought was so powerful by Pastor Freddie Russell, when he said to the parents that your responsibility is not to always correct them in a physical manner, but to teach them cause and I was listening. I was listening, Pastor. I was listening, all right? You're leading and I'm following, okay? That you must teach the children cause and effect. We must teach children, yea, God must teach us cause and effect. Am I right about it? So it's principles unchanging, but also we need to see in this in this vision, in this theophany, that was the word I gave you, in this theophany, is this powerful manifestation of providence. Providence. That in the midst of this vision, God is saying that I am still God. You have not arrived in Babylon by mistake. I am with you in Babylon. Now, some of you May, may emphasize grace, but you, you don't capture that the value of mercy, the value of what? Mercy. Is so that you will appreciate grace. Yeah. Yeah. 
If you don't accept mercy, when mercy is provided, you'll never receive your required portion of grace. Mercy is your wake up. It's your spiritual alarm clock. I am without a job because God had me fired because I would not be faithful in my tithe. Y'all not with me today? Y'all with me? Oh yeah, that's the way it works. So God says, until you figure it out, you don't need a job. You don't need a job. Let me tell you why you don't need a job. Because you don't need me. Listen to me talk to you now. Listen to me talk to you. You don't need me. You say, yes, God, I need you. Oh, no, you don't need me. Yes, God, I do need you. Oh, no, you don't need me. Why do you think I don't need you, God? Because you don't need me until a crisis. I never forget the late C.D. Brooks was preaching in one of my churches, and he, he talked about what he called fire escape religion. What's fire escape religion, preacher? Fire escape religion means you only find God when there's a fire that breaks out and you're trying to get out. You look for God. God, I'm unemployed. Lord, you know I got all these children to feed. I got a wife who got me in this big old house and I need to cut the mortgage and now I'm unemployed. God said, oh, so now you want to talk to me. And the children of Israel at this location by the river Kibar. Now, let me share this with you. Kibar no longer exists. Kibar is thought to be a tributary, or was thought, or is thought to have been a tributary from the river Euphrates. And so really it was more like a, a stream. It was a canal or something to that effect. And so they're sitting there and they're looking at each other. Have you ever hung out with the folk in the hood and nobody says anything? And they just kind of look at each other? Because everybody's in misery? Y'all with me today? I mean, come on, all of your family is now middle class. Come on now, come on somebody. Am I right about it? Okay, and you sitting there and you don't say anything because the grief is so thick, it's palpable, right? And so everybody's just sitting there. I never forget the first time that I pastored in the deep south and I'm not going to tell you where I passed it. I'll just say it was deep south. And uh, I, w I went to the house of the, of the deceased, and the family was sitting around in a large circle. People would come in, they'd bring food. And I was learning the culture of the community, and nobody said a word. And everybody just sat there. Mm -hmm. Would you pass me some water? Mm -hmm. And I was like, I was watching my people and I was like, really? I'd never seen that culture. But that's the way they were by Kibar. And they were all sitting and watching each other. Nobody wanted to take ownership for their mess. You have situations in your life that God has not, God has not abandoned you. You've abandoned God. And so God shows up to share with Ezekiel, basically in word pictures, tell my people if they would just stop commiserating. Get off the pity pot and just do some confession and repentance. Y'all not with me, huh? If my people who are called by my name shall do what? Humble themselves. Well, wait a minute. We like to rush past that part and get to the and pray. Well, there is a key pivotal part of that text. Shall we do what? Humble themselves. You know, when you have to humble yourself, you are really moving up the ladder of Christian growth. Are y'all with me today? I know we'll forget. Let me give you this very quickly. I know we'll forget. Good Lord, have mercy. Let me tell you this. I know we'll forget. I know we'll forget. Let me share this with you. I know when the Review and Herald Corporation Association took the, made the decision in May of 2014 to close, and our general conference president came and, you know, tried to soothe things over and everything was trying to, you know, be made right. 
And then I got a call from the then General Conference Treasurer. His name was Bob Lemon. Yes, I want that to go down in the record. He called me on my home phone. Samuel, we only have about 30 more days we're going to carry you. And all of a sudden, my salary was coming to an end. My life was about to change. And I was in this big house, fully furnished, two cars in the garage. And I was like, oh, Lord, my salary is about to be over. And for 15 months, for how long? 15 for 15 months, I had no salary. But God took care of me. Now, before we get to the shouting part, before I get to this third point very quickly, let me just share this with you very, very quickly. I want you to understand something, that when you are in a tough spot, never doubt the providence of God. Don't, ex don't, don't, don't think that all of a sudden you have caught God by surprise, like he woke up and said, oh, what happened when I was sleeping? God knows where you are and he knows your circumstances and he understands your situation. And in, in so many instances, he actually ordained us to be at that tight spot. Because I'm gonna tell you something, during that 15 months, I learned how to pray. Y'all with me? I mean, I really learned how to pray. I, let me tell you something. This preacher that you're looking at right now, I don't look too bad, do I? No, I want you to know something. God kept me. Through that 15-month period, I had to shovel snow. I had to cut grass. Come on now. I had to do some odd jobs to keep food on the table. But God never left me. And I want to share this with you that not only are his principles fixed, his providence permanent, but his presence is definable. His presence is what? Definable. One more time. His presence is what? And that's what we see. In this last and third point, I want you to see that when Ezekiel gives us this, this description of this theophany, it's Christ. And I know that you're thinking, well, how do we know it's Jesus? How do we know it's Jesus, the ox, the man, the lion, and the eagle? Go with me to Revelation. I told you we were going there. Go with me to Revelation. What book did I say, everybody? Revelation, Revelation chapter 4. Listen to what John sees. He sees the throne of God in heaven. After this, I looked and behold, a door was opened in heaven. And the door and the first voice which I heard was as it were of a trumpet talking with me which said, come up hither and I will show thee things which must be hereafter. And immediately I was in the spirit and behold a throne. What everybody? Okay, now this is the same kind of vision that Moses had and then Ezekiel had. So he sees a throne in heaven and there was one who sat on the throne and he that, was to, he, he that sat was to look upon like jasper and a sardine stone and there was a rainbow round about the throne in sight like unto an emerald. Now, let me tell you, when you see the color green, emerald, let me share this with you very quickly. Because you see it in Ezekiel, you're seeing hope. What are you seeing, everybody? When Ezekiel sees it, he's in captivity. Get this now. When John sees the emerald, he's on the Isle of Patmos. Come on now. Y'all got to stay with me now. And so in the midst of the deepest travail, in the midst of the most gripping situation, God sends an emerald stone, which is green. Hope, 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 like the bursting forth of a bud on a tree after blistering cold winter. God says, I will be there. 
I will be there. I'll walk you through. But notice, if you will, notice, if you will, not only does he see this emerald, but notice very quickly here, I want, to, want you to see this. And round about the throne were four and twenty seats, and upon the seats I saw four and twenty elders sitting, clothed in white raiment, and they had on their heads crowns of gold. And out of the throne proceeding lightnings and thunderings and voices, and there were seven lamps of fire burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne was a sea of glass like unto crystal. And in the midst of the throne and round about the throne were four beasts full of eyes before and behind. Verse 7. And the first beast was like a? And the second beast was like a? And the third beast was like the face of a? And the fourth beast was like a? The same four that are in Ezekiel. One and two. Let me give it to you very quickly. The four beasts encompass the four points on the compass. How do I know that? Because they represent Dan, the tribe of Dan, the tribe of Reuben, the tribe of Levi, and the tribe of Judah. Y'all with me? Four points. And each one of those tribes had a assigned, had an assigned location in the camp of Israel around the sanctuary. And so they represent the four points on the compass. And so what God is saying through symbolism, he says, there's no place on this planet you can go that I'm not already there. Lo, I will be with you even until the end of the age. Ah, but more important than that, let's understand what those four, those four faces symbolize. First of all, we have the face. Let's look at it. Let's go in, 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 in systematic order, in sequence. Here it, here it is. The face of a lion. Christ is the lion of the tribe of Judah. Okay. The second beast was like a calf. The calf symbolizing the perfect sacrifice. Also the beast of burden in the Middle East. And what that simply means is that Christ is ever toiling for our salvation. Y'all not with me. He's ever toiling for our salvation. He's ever desirous that we, be, we would be saved. He never gets tired. Thirdly, here it is very quickly. This is what it says. And the third beast was the face of a man. Did Jesus become man and dwell on this earth? All right. And then finally, finally, a flying eagle. In Ezekiel, it talks about the fact that Jesus is not only like the eagle, but he has talons and he is holding the serpent in his claws. What does that symbolize? That he has victory over the devil, that old serpent, the devil. Y'all not with me today? That he has destroyed the devil. He has already claimed victory, that it is already ours by faith. So how do we, how do we conclude this? How do we wrap this up? Here's how we wrap this up. That his principles are fixed, and he wants us to never forget his principles. He never wants us to forget who he is and what he stands for. He wants us to never forget that his providence is always there. But more specifically, the difference between the providence and the presence is a fine line, nevertheless distinctive. Because in providence, it means that he's everywhere, but in presence, it means he's personal. In providence, he's everywhere, but in presence, he is one-on-one. -on -one. In providence, it means that he is watching over Berean, but in presence, he's watching over you. In providence, it means that he has not left the Adventist church. He raised it up for a purpose, so he has not left this church. But in presence, it means he's watching over Berean as an emblem of that global church. A is watching over this pastor. He is watching over the leaders. He is watching over each and every one of us. He is walking with you. He is talking with you. And if we will hear him, he will lead us. He will carry us. He will teach us. He will be with us. He will carry us. We will always be in him and with him if we treasure his presence. I have to ask this question. 
Does your life exemplify the principles of God? Does your life exemplify that God is over you in his providence? Does your life exemplify that you actually have a confidence and a trust in God? You know why I ask that question? Because none of us choose or desire hardship. The difference between a diamond and coal, I'm talking about the coal that they use in furnaces, blast furnaces to make steel. The difference is the pressure that's applied. Are you with me? Here it is very quickly. Coal hasn't been under any pressure. The composition is relatively the same. But when the pressures the geologists say when the pressures of the earth begin to press down on the coal and there's a friction and there's a movement and there's a tension that begins to apply all of the right and move all of the right elements that are found within that coal, it begins to become a different composition. It moves from being coal to a diamond. Gold. Have you ever seen the bars that say 0.999? What they're saying is almost completely pure. No impurities. No base metals. The challenges of life press us. They challenge us. They make us cry. They make us fall on our face. Our faces. The challenges of life that God allows us to go through, don't resist them. Don't fight them. Don't push against them. Don't shy away from them. Don't Turn your back on them. Embrace them. Did not our Lord, did not our Lord say, Lord, Father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but thy will be done. So my question to you, my question to you, the cup he gives you, will you drink of it? Where he leads me, I've got to follow. It may not always be a fun life, it may not always be a cash rich life, it may not always be a sick, a sick free life may not always be a disease-free life, may not always be a trouble-free life, but I tell you what it will be, it will be a God-filled life. Where he leads me, I will follow. Where he leads me, I will follow. Who's going to lead us in that? Come on, sing that for us. Listen to these words as she sings. I can hear my Savior calling can hear my Savior calling. I can hear my Savior calling. Take thy cross and follow, follow. I will find 
follow Where he leads me I will follow Where he leads me I will follow I'll go with him With him all the way I'll go with him through the garden I'll go with him through the garden I'll go with him through the garden I'll go with him with him all the way I'll go with him through the judgment I'll go with him through the judgment I'll go with him through the judgment I'll go with him with him all the way. If you're willing to go with the Lord today, I invite you to stand. Just stand. For just a moment, we're going to bow our heads. And we're going to talk to the Father. And we're going to thank Him for the trials, the difficulties, the experiences of our lives by which he has permitted to come our way. We're going to say thank you, Lord, for the grief, for the sorrow, for the pain, for the challenges. We're going to say, Lord, I'm so grateful that you care so much about me. You're trying to save me. I care so much, Lord, that you care about me. Father in heaven, our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. We just want to say a brief prayer. Thank you for all the difficulties, for all the challenges, for all the fire, for all the storms, for all the regrets that we have to now acknowledge were our fault and not yours. Lord, I ask you to give us a heart to say thank you if we don't know how to say thank you. So Lord, I want to say thank you. Thank you for 15 months of unemployment. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for helping me to have a closer relationship with you. Thank you, Lord, for permitting me to have that time of separation from daily responsibilities that I could just sit alone in the closet, as it were, and talk to you and learn from you. Thank you, oh God, for what you did. Thank you. But Lord, I want to add to this prayer that someone in this church, maybe even watching on the webcast, is saying, Lord, I have messed up my life. I've not been walking in faithfulness. I've not been walking in principle. I've been walking outside of your providence. I have been ignoring your presence. And Lord, today I want to start all over again. If that's your conviction, I invite you to come down right now. If that's your conviction, I want you to come down right now. Come on, come on, you're there, you're there. Whether you're in the balcony or on the main floor, you're there some child, some adult, some teenager, some senior, you need to come out from where you are and say, Lord, I want to start all over again. Come on. Come on. We have the time for you. Come on. Don't be ashamed. Nobody's going to do investigative research to find out why you're coming. We just want you to come. This is an opportunity for you. We don't want you to miss it. We don't want you to bypass it. We don't want you to leave this place not having made that commitment. So I invite you to come. Come, wherever you are. Come on. The Holy Spirit is 
speaking to your heart, touching your life, rolling through your mind all of the circumstances and situations that you have endured, many of which you put yourself in. God had nothing to do with it. But his hand is still on you. His hand is still working with you. His hand is still providing the support and providing the encouragement and providing the security and providing the, the direction that you don't have for your life. I invite you to come. Come on. Where he leads me. Come on, we can sing that together. Where he leads me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Come on now. Where he leads me, I will follow. Will you go with him? Where he leads me, I will follow. Will you go? I'll go with him. With him. All the way. One more time. Where he leads me. Where he leads me, I will follow. Come on now, are you serious about following him? Where he leads me, I will follow. Are you really going to follow him? If you're going to really follow him, put your hand up. If you're really going to follow him, put your hand up. Oh yes, Lord, we're going to follow him. I'll go with you. With him. Oh. comes another where he leads me I will follow is there another one is there another one that's right sing it surrender all quietness of your own heart and mind and lay everything before God very quietly in your own thoughts close your eyes ask God to show you that marvelous vision of his providence of his principles and his presence because all of them are in Christ Christ ever leading, Christ ever directing, Christ ever encouraging, Christ ever supporting, Christ there directing, guiding. Father in heaven, we thank you for these souls that have come. I pray, Lord, that you would seal their decisions. And for the rest of this, of us that are standing on our feet, whose hands have gone up in submission, I pray, O oh Lord, that you will indeed give us the strength to follow you in faithfulness. Give us the decided minds to walk with you no matter where you lead. For we ask it in Christ's name. And for his sake we pray. Amen and amen.